Prayer Primer, Igniting a Fire Within, by Father Thomas Dubay. Chapter 9, Contemplation. If you have a problem with the title of this chapter being in a book intended for beginners in prayer, most likely you have company. Since contemplation is an advanced development of communing with God, why do we devote a section to it in a primer? Actually, we are not going to say a great deal about this advancing prayer, but only what beginners should know in order to grow from where they are to where they want to someday be. Hence, we begin by offering a few answers to our question. Why this chapter? Our first response is that in any worthwhile journey, most of us want to know where our destination is and how we are to get to it. We also like to know whether the trip is worth all the trouble and expense. The second reason is that in living things, and prayer is our supremely living activity, we understand the, beginning, the beginnings fully only when we grasp their mature, complete stage of growth. We see the meaningfulness of a, of a tadpole adequately only when we have seen an adult frog and all it can do. We appreciate the first steps of the spiritual life to the extent that we understand and come closer to living the virtues heroically well. We appreciate where meditation is leading us only if we grasp something of contemplative communing with the indwelling trinity. Moreover, both our private and liturgical prayers take on a whole new dimension when we understand something of their inner life and vitality, and the more deeply we appreciate this the more fruitful they are likely to be. Thirdly, we have already noted that when sincere people know little or nothing of meditative and contemplative prayer, they often assume that there is no other prayer but vocal. Then many of them burden themselves with whole lists of words and formulas, leaving no time for deepening their interpersonal relationship with the Lord. If this volume had nothing about meditation and contemplation, we would be reinforcing this sad error. It would be like making a map that explains only the beginning of a trip. Fourthly, knowing the beauty of a deep immersion in God and how it opens the path to heroic holiness and that it is meant for everyone, we are encouraged to make the sacrifices entailed in making it possible. Lastly, Contemplative prayer can be taught effectively even to young people who are living the gospel with generosity. Thus, they should know enough about it to recognise its first beginnings and so know how to avoid putting obstacles in the way of what the Holy Spirit wants to bestow on them. What contemplative prayer is not? Before we sketch briefly what our deepening immersion in the Trinity is, we must insist that it is very far from an oriental state of impersonal awareness produced by techniques and methods. Thus, it should not be confused with Buddhist or Hindu exercises, nor is it introspection, dwelling on one's own inner life, feelings and thoughts. And of course, we are not here speaking about visions and revelations. These are not meant for everyone. Finally, our contemplation is not simply thinking things over, nor is it more or less strong emotional feelings about God and religious matters. What contemplation is? While meditative prayer involves reading, thinking, imagining, drawing conclusions, and conversing inwardly with the indwelling trinity, contemplation is none of these things. Rather, it is a real awareness of God, desiring and loving him, which we do not produce, but simply receive from him when we are ready for it. There are no images, ideas or words. In the first stages, what he gives is usually a dry desire for him, that is, with little or no feelings, or it is a gentle, delightful awareness of his presence. Both of these two types of awareness are brief. They are just there, that is, not produced in a human manner. They cannot be had whenever we want them. No methods or techniques can produce them. 
when we have lived the gospel generously in our state of life, and this includes fidelity to meditative prayer, God begins to grant this superior type of communing with himself. What the Lord gives, infuses, is another word for this, is at first usually delicate, gentle and brief. The recipient will most likely continue to experience distractions. But this advancing type of prayer progressively grows as time goes on in both depth and duration. Again we repeat, if we continue to live the gospel in a wholehearted manner. At times it can become a deep absorption, so deep that distractions cease for five or ten minutes. However, this absorbing prayer is advancing contemplation, which we need not explain further at this point. Transition from meditation to contemplation. Living things, we have noted, develop gradually, not by leaps and bounds. Each of us has spent nine months in, in his mother's womb, then several years as an infant and child, more years as teenager and young adult. Then comes middle age and maturity. So also our communing with God is a gradual process from the humanly produced kind of relationship to the divine given desiring and loving. This latter itself grows in depth and splendour all the way to what is called the transforming union. This growth process from one glory to another is due to the divine initiation, not to our mere wish to have it happen. The transition stage is part of the gradual growth to a fullness. Marvellous though created realities are, they cannot of themselves lead us to deep intimacy with Father, Son and Holy Spirit. There is no human power that can bring us into the inner Trinitarian life. Something radically new is needed. In a similar way, human muscle power, even that of the most gifted athlete, will never be enough for anyone to jump to the moon. Something basically different is needed. Rocket power. God is not only greater than anything created, he is endlessly greater. He is purest and unlimited power, love, joy, goodness, life and beauty. Literally, he is unspeakable. That we may know and embrace him intimately, he, mu he must take the initiative to bring the endless gap, bridge the endless gap. He alone can do it. He must bestow the new light, love, beauty, delight. Since we are not talking now about visions or revelations, it is a question of a kind of prayer beyond all created input, images, ideas. It is a divine way of praying, far beyond our human capacities. How is this infinite gap bridged? The Lord alone does it when we are ready. And beginners get ready by daily meditative prayer, together with getting rid of their venial sins. When they are sufficiently purified by this renewing lifestyle, they will begin to notice on occasion an inclination to prayer to leave thinking aside. At the same time, they notice a desire to be with God in a wordless way. At other times, they will be inclined to meditate. They are in the transitional stage. The rule of thumb at this point is to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. That is, you do what he inclines you to do at prayer time. If you find it easy to meditate and it seems to work, then do that. If, on the other hand, you are inclined simply to be with him without words, do that. Be patient during this transitional period. Do not worry about occasional unwilled distractions that occur. Be gentle in turning away from them and back to the Lord who is drawing you. Degrees of growth. Like our examples of the acorn becoming the oak or the baby developing into the teenager and the adult, contemplative communion with the Trinity gradually grows in both duration and intensity. 
as long as the person remains self-giving in the usual details of human life. One slowly leaves the transitional stage as the infused desire and love for the Lord becomes habitual. If all goes well, once in a while there may be a profound and intensely delightful absorption in God, when for a few minutes there are no distractions at all. If one continues to grow, this communion can become ecstatic and then should grow on to the summit, the transforming union. These advanced degrees of contemplation are described by Saints Teresa of Avila and Saint John of the Cross. Scripture proclaims contemplation for everyone. For some strange reason not easy to fathom, many religiously minded men and women seem not to realise how frequently and strongly the biblical word speaks of this remarkable intimacy each of us is called to have with our unspeakable God. It is an interpersonal closeness, identical with what we are discussing so briefly in this chapter. Scripture couches this intimacy in expressions of touching beauty, loveliness, charm, and yes, tenderness. Some illustrations will help. We are to look to the Lord and be radiant with joy, to taste and experience how surpassingly good he is. Psalm 34, 5, 8. This communing with him is the most important thing we are privileged to do in our lives, to gaze on the divine beauty, a perfect definition of contemplative prayer. Psalm 27, 4. We are invited to grow to the point where our mind's eye is on him always. Psalm 25, 15. That is, to be head over heels in love with our origin and our unspeakable destiny, which, of course, makes us all the better for everyone else. This constant divine awareness is one of the traits of the transforming summit. Not surprisingly, our very heart and our flesh sing for joy to the living God. Psalm 84, 2. We hunger and thirst for him after the manner of a parched desert, needing the refreshment of clear, cool water. Psalm 63, 1. The New Testament continues and deepens the message of the old dispensation. We who hunger and thirst for quenching at the unlimited fountain are to be filled with the utter fullness and mind-boggling thought. We are called to be overflowing with this inexpressible joy, to be rejoicing always, to be praying always and everywhere. We are to give thanks and praise to our God in everything we do. How more exalted could the human person be? Indeed, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, we cannot even dream of what God has in store for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2.9 Because sacred scripture is written for people in all states of life, all of these contemplative texts express the goal for all of us, beginners as well as the advanced. It goes without saying that the teachings of the church and her saints through the centuries have the same clear message as what the inspired word declares. She places these very texts and others like them on our lips repeatedly in her official liturgies. Transformation of daily life. Even though contemplative prayer does not usually suggest specific solutions to the ordinary problems of daily life, it does go a long way in providing an insightful atmosphere and a mighty motivation to address them with love. As husband and wife grow in their intimacy with God, loving dialogue and listening to each other tend to replace arguing and bickering. They become more inclined to compromise in practical practicalities, that is, when no principle is at stake. A genuine love for each other and for their children necessarily deepens. A conviction arises that unity and a shared vision take precedence over the attitude that I must, ha I must have my way. A joyous willingness to embrace sacrifices and hardships replaces complaining and bitterness. The spouses generously forgive each other and seek forgiveness for their own faults. With the growing divine light and love, 
which lie at the very core of contemplative prayer. They see things with a perspective and proportion. Big things appear big and trivial things trivial. They become more real, seeing reality as it really is. It is easy to see why marriages in which both partners are committed to a deep prayer life are happy indeed. If all this appears utopian, I can only say, try it out and you will see. All this is true, obviously, for, con for convents and rectories, nursing homes and hospitals, indeed for all primary communities. Contemplative clergy, for example, are more concerned and compassionate and caring at the bedside and in the confessional. Their homilies, stemming as they do from inner fire, are far more effective and have greater impact. This is why saints in all states of life change not only themselves, they change the world as well. At least that part of the world willing to give up its egocentrism. Meditation developing slowly into contemplation transforms people from the inside out. Men and women come alive with a renewing joy and inner vibrancy as they leave aside the artificial stimulations of worldliness and shed the boredom and jadedness worldly trivialities bring about. As they turn to triune beauty and to progressively deepening prayer life, their inner em empty aching is replaced by experiencing what eye has not seen nor ear heard a transformation from one glory to another. 2 Corinthians 3.18